Hello, Sam. I can hear you and I can now see you. How are you? Excellent, Barry. How are you? I'm good. Happy New Year to you, by the way. And to you. I like your T-shirt. That's fab, isn't it? It's rather good. It's rather splendid. Yes, we're a bit of an old hippie, I think. I've only had the hair for it. That's what I think. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to clean my camera. Well, anyway, my first question has to be is you've got this uh, new album. Um, it's out on the 20th of January, by the way. It's called Number 8. Yeah. Uh, put a pre-ordering link just below this video and encourage everyone to go out and buy it. That is very nice of you, Barry. Thank you. What is the significance of the number eight? Um, well, uh, a long time ago, I was doing a gig um, and one of my fans came up to me at the end and said, I love uh, what you're doing with your album titles. And I said, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. And he said, well, you're spelling your name. So I thought, oh. so Stop was the first album, April Moon. Um, and then the third album is called 43 Minutes, which is slightly dubious, I think. Then Box was the fourth album, Reboot. And this that was the point at which this person came and told me, and I, I had absolutely no idea. Oh. So then I was stuck with O, W, and N. Um, and, uh, yeah, so so that's that, really. Uh, so the, the next album is called Of The Moment, which a fan wrote in and suggested. And the last album is called Wednesday, The Something of April, which is a live album, funnily enough, recorded on a Wednesday in April. Yeah. And then we got to N, which finishes my name. Right, right. <laughs> um, number. Number eight. Yeah, I did, you know, there were lots of suggestions of uh, very clever names but i thought i'd go with something quite plain in the end <laughs> right, right well you know it's um it's i think it's your first studio album like 15 years is that right yeah uh of the moment was released in 2007 right well sorry obviously you can anticipate my next question really it's um, um what have i been doing well why why so long between studio <laughs> albums i mean there's a fascinating story uh, around what you've gone through for this album uh, i wonder if you could kind of relate that to us yeah so um i lost my singing voice in 2007 uh well i, I found i couldn't sing as i usually could and oh i am sorry i shall turn my my email off because we don't want that thing bonging all the way through um <laughs> Uh, I, I lost my voice. Um, I was going through a marriage breakdown and and uh, had having a bit of a tough time, and carried on working. And then in two thousand and seven, I just was having real problems pitching, and uh, I haven't been able to sing professionally since. Right. So uh, I had the live album recorded. That was from two thousand and four, and we mixed it a couple of years ago. And then uh, in lockdown. <clears throat> A friend of mine said, why don't we write? And so every Tuesday we got together on online and, uh, and wrote some songs. And uh, it was a very interesting experience. But yeah. that that's basically what, in a, in a quite large nutshell, what happened. I mean, I can uh, imagine uh, an artist or a musician losing the ability to sing or play. I mean, gosh, that must be absolutely devastating. I mean, you, you we're reminded of the story of uh, Keith Emerson, of course, who couldn't play towards the end he had trouble with his hands didn't he yeah but it's, it must be it must have been absolutely devastating I mean, how do you get over something that is uh, so important to you sort of being taken away from you it must have uh, must have been a, a tough old journey for you um it, it has it has been tough um but i'm i think i'm quite a practical person uh and um i mean writing writing came back very quickly uh, the singing of, when I did it on this album was very difficult and quite upsetting. Uh, but as soon as I started to auto-tune everything, it came together and it sounded good. So whilst it wasn't anything like the joyful experience that singing used to be, um, right. it, it certainly was a, a very rewarding and, and made me made me happy that I could actually create something, you know. Um, but, yeah, it has been difficult. I think, you know, financially it's difficult when you lose your main source of income. I'm sure there are lots of people in the world who've experienced that. It's not an easy thing. Um, and and I loved, I just loved singing. I mean, I, you know, more than anything, except my children. It sure. was just <laughs> the most important thing to me and defined me as a person. So I suppose there's all sorts of psychological and, and emotional 
um, you know, things that will have affected me, but I can't say that I'm aware of all of them. I've tried to all sorts of things to get my voice back, but none of them have worked. And I've I've come to the conclusion that it's probably some sort of emotional blockage. (laughs) I don't know, but but how one goes about dealing with that, I don't know. (laughs) Uh, Maybe you'll just rediscover it. uh, Maybe I will. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Maybe well, so. it's interesting. You you talk about this this, uh, but the tracks on your album, uh, just looking at them, uh, they're almost the by the titles. The first four is like it's okay, doll injured another day. It almost seems to be spelling out a narrative, in a way for what you've perhaps gone through. I wonder if that was your intention. Uh, well, I suppose I've always written about what's happening in my life. Um, I think you know. I very quickly realised, especially with Stop being such a big hit, although that really wasn't about me. It was funnily enough, it was about, it was this kind of story. Um, But I mean, I do it myself. You know, we all relate to music, don't we? We relate to the story in music. So I think being sort of nearly 60, I feel slightly differently about it now. It's less sort of, I hope, less Dear Diary and a bit more... I've had this experience and I know other people have had this experience and therefore, you know, putting into music is a positive use of that energy, isn't it? You know, to, because I think people do have difficult times and uh, I feel like uh, it's a good story. You know, I haven't got my voice back, but there are other wonderful things that are happening that, you know, are, that mean I can still have a good life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a lot of artists, of course, their vo- uh, their voices change naturally as part of the aging process. Um, yeah, yeah. I think there's numerous. I mean, uh, Paul Stanley uh, from Kiss, he gets a lot of uh, flack about not sounding. He often says, "If you want to hear what I sounded like on Kiss Alive from 1975, just go and put that record on." Yeah, exactly. You just I can't agree. Get... He says, "I can't yeah. sing like I was when I was 21." But um, I suppose a lot of artists record these songs. They don't anticipate they're going to be still singing them in 40 years' time. No, no, that's right. And and then I think there's a lot of pressure to do that, isn't there? I mean, you know, uh, I, I remember when I did have my voice, I was constantly getting asked to go on 80s things, shows right. and tours and stuff. But it never really appealed to me because I was still making music. Um, and you know, a measure of success for me isn't financial reward. It's whether I think it's a good record. Uh, in the same way, a carpenter would like to make a really nice piece of furniture. It's about that for me. It's about the craft of making an album and making yeah. a, a whole album. Um, so I was never really kind of pulled into redoing stuff. I mean, I could sing "Stop" very well, actually, probably better than I could originally. But uh, and I was very happy to sing it. But I felt that I wanted to do my new stuff, and it's about creating things, isn't it? Well, it's about being a, an artist and expressing yourself rather than being, uh, I think Robert Plant said, I'm not a jukebox. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and may, you know, maybe you should say, you know, this is my album, this is how I sound now, you know, and um, yeah. as a, a bold statement. And it's, uh, uh, would, you, would you consider um, doing any live gigs off the back of this album, maybe? I'd love to, but I really can't sing. I mean, when I say I lost my voice, I literally can't sing. I can sing yeah. about three notes. Um, I, there's no way I could get on a stage and sing. Sing. Um, there's all sorts of uh, trickery that can be used, which I'm not averse to using, and certainly have used a lot of what well, the whole album vocally is also tuned. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think I've earned my stripes, so I don't feel bad about doing that. No, and no. so it's just making something, isn't it? You know, lot, lots of good records use effects and a process. So yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of artists are uh, doing that live now as well. They're using backing tracks and all sorts of things. But uh, yeah, I don't think that's a new thing, though, is it, Barry? I mean, that's been going on for years. People well, it's only, like... with the internet and everyone films concerts now. Yeah, that people get yeah. Uh, caught out a lot more. I think. And it's uh, true. It's true. Yeah, I mean, I, I question. I mean, you, um, uh, I think Fleetwood Mac recently. I they have a, a whole spate of musicians behind the curtain, and I'm thinking, well, what actually, what actually am I hearing Fleetwood Mac play? <laughs> and then you know, it's uh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. It's, as an audience member, I'm thinking, I think they're, I think there's such a worry that they're not going to be able to deliver when there's so much expectation and ticket prices are yeah just these days as well. So there must be a lot of pressure on, but. Would you describe this album then as a lockdown album? 
Yeah, I suppose I would. Well, there's a whole subgenre of lockdown albums now, isn't it? The Foo Fighters, <laughs> McCartney. <laughs> I think in years to come, people will study these lockdown albums, and you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, there's the 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 dreadful side to lockdown, and the you know the the awful reality of having that kind of virus let loose on the world. Yeah. But there is a positive side, and that's that lots of people have become very creative again. You know, which and is great. great. Music. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Interesting, uh, interesting question for you. If you could go back um if you had a um flux capacitor i don't know if you're a big fan of back to the future if you go <laughs> back to the sam brown that made stop what bit, what bit of advice would you offer yourself oh gosh that's a hard uh, question isn't it it is there's a couple of stinkers on this list by the way so oh. <laughs> that well first of all i love back to the future um, oh, absolutely doesn't it's, it's wonderful. To get into that DeLorean, what wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, <laughs> um, and uh, I think really I would just say to myself, just calm down, slow down a bit, and take it easy because I have always kind of rushed headlong at life, mostly work. I've always been a bit of a workaholic, and I and I think probably that did contribute to me losing my voice. So yeah, just try and enjoy life a bit more and, and relax. Just enjoy the ride. Yeah. Yes. Well, do you not think the business you're in pressures you constantly to be doing more and more? Yes, I do. I do think it does. And I responded to that. But the truth is, I didn't have to respond to that. I could have said, I'm not working on those days because the world still turns, doesn't it? When you, well, as lockdown so, so beautifully uh, illustrated, you know, the, everything can stop, but life still goes on, doesn't it? Because it does. It always does. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many bands uh, um, attribute their breakup due to just overwork and being pushed too hard and it just fragments, really. Right. Let's see more questions for you. Uh, I've answered <laughs> that one uh, before I grill you on the Floyd years. <laughs> um, I've you, oh, well, I will start with the um, before I grill you on the Floyd years. I've got to ask you, what is it about the ukulele that interests you so much? Uh, they're quite portable, and uh, if you hit someone with one, uh, it doesn't damage them too badly. No, no one for my really. wife, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's just such a easy instrument to pick up. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm I'm a musician, and I I can pick up an instrument and get a tune out of it. Right. But I'm not. I think the only instrument I was really good at was my voice. I play piano. I play a bit of bass. A bit of this. A bit of that. Um, but the uke is such a. It's it's a. As my dad always says, you can't help but be happy. You know, if you're playing a ukulele. Right. Um, I know that it perhaps doesn't seem like the coolest instrument in the world to people, but the fact is, is that you can play anything on the ukulele. Mm -hmm. Um, I think people tend to see the pork pie hats and the Hawaiian shirts and the George Formby songs, mm -hmm. but there's so much more to it. You can play really beautiful things yeah. uh, on the uke, and um, I just love it. And I, and actually, it's not so much about the uke for me. It's about discovering that I can impart some of my experience musically to people who've never been fortunate enough to have those experiences mostly retired people uh who just love being a part of something really musical you know and lovely absolutely well i mean you're i suppose you're right to say it's not the coolest of instruments but it's certainly cooler than the tuba isn't it <laughs> you know, something... well, well, i don't know herbie flowers <laughs> plays a tuba and you don't get much cooler than herbie flowers <laughs> no that's true that's true but i don't get many people invited to parties saying bring your tuba along with me that it <laughs> Um, but the ukulele, I mean, you you because my my children get ukulele lessons, you know, because it's quite a big Ooh. thing for ukulele teachers going into schools. Perhaps it's because the the instruments are far more accessible, maybe than than other instruments. Yes, and less spit. Oh, absolutely! You definitely want that uh, during all these masks on now. Do so yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> probably makes tuba playing quite difficult. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I mean, because uh, they they seem to like it's a very bright sounding instrument, uh, as you you say. I mean, um, yeah. Go on. Well, it, it's the thing about the uke is it. Well, first of all, it's very easy to play. It is. Okay. I mean, it's it's not 
as easy as just pressing something. I mean, it is a little bit more complicated than that, but um, it's easy to play. And also it's primarily, I think, a, a rhythm instrument, you know. So it's about the rhythm. It's all about the rhythm of it. And that immediately makes it very up, you know, very, very uh uh, just fun, really. I think it's fun, and for kids, it, it's very quick for them to actually get a sound out of it, and that's that's rewarding. Mm. Whereas if you try not, I mean, I remember recorder lessons. I mean, it must have sounded awful, you know, twenty children playing recorders. Can you imagine? Yeah. Um, so I think the uke's a lot nicer. Yes, I think being able to play three blind mice on the recorder has fared me very well in life. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've got to grill you about the the the, the, the Floyd years. You, you probably get asked about it all the time, but uh, my channel is predominantly um, uh, a huge prog audience, uh, yeah. classic rock audience. But what was it like being on stage with all those inflatable pigs and lasers and all that sort of pyrotechnics going off around you? I mean, it, it's well, what's it feel like from the stage perspective rather than the audience? Um, well, first of all, you're a part of something. You know, you're you are a part of the Pink Floyd machine. Yeah, uh, welcome to the machine. Yeah, and <laughs> um, it, it is, it's amazing. I, I remember my, I think my favourite time was uh, we did musical rehearsals in London uh, for the band, all the band. And then we went out to uh, the West Coast in America and we rehearsed in an aircraft hangar. Mm -hmm. And the stage set was so, it was so big, so it was 180 foot high. Um, and I think that's just a big round screen at the back. Right. So it, it's absolutely massive. And then at the sound podium was outside of the hangar. That's how big the whole setup was. And then you had this rose that came up. And the so we sort of, we kind of got to grips with the music already. So it was then the production rehearsals. Um, and, and the whole, I, I think the thing about working with Pink Floyd is you become engulfed in this amazing um beautiful surreal world you know uh, it started off with so staying at this hotel it was a two-hour drive to the aircraft hangar so we'd all get onto a bus mm. and everybody very much there's a lot of people involved so your traveling party is like 30 people um so there's lots of people um you get on the bus and we had this two-hour mini bus ride and it was i would say 90 percent of the ride drive was through the desert God. with wind turbines on either side right. so i'm there and i'm listening to pink floyd because i'm learning i'm checking and listening to the music and checking things and kind of in my head rehearsing and stuff and we're driving along and you've just got miles and miles and miles of wind turbines and it's just so surreal you know yeah. and then you get there and then you play the music and then all this stuff is happening around you i mean it's incredible it was incredible really incredible and i think the great thing about it was that the everything revolved around the show you know it wasn't a big everyone got on fine and it was lovely yeah. and everybody was nice and you know there's that but it wasn't a big kind of rock and roll vibe or anything like that it was just all about pulling the show together um so just an incredible experience really a really uh lovely and abstract experience is what i want to say yeah it's interesting you say that uh, uh you read something like the accounts of truman truman capote's accounts of touring with the rolling stones in 1972 and it's uh and uh, nick mason i think it was in nick mason's autobiography it might have been him uh, he said um in comparison, going out on the road with Floyd is like going out with a, um, a firm of touring accountants. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was him that said that, in, you know, or some other book. But it, um, I, I think that there may may have been some small pockets of rock and rollness going on somewhere. But um, I I took my daughter with me; she was six months old, so right. um, I I wasn't party to to any of the rock and rollness. But. Uh, you know, it it was all very. It was about the music. It's about the music. That's the thing. Absolutely, Floyd have always been uh, about that. Don't look at us. Look at the stage and listen to yeah. the music. So I saw, uh, I saw them on the Momentary Lapse of Reason tour um, a couple of times. You weren't with them then, I don't think. I think you joined the Vision Bell tour. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I did do a couple of bits. I mean, I it was the third time I'd been asked. I had to turn it down the first two times, which I have to say was a very difficult thing to do because I really wanted to do it. But I knew David, so, um, you know, and I, I'd love to do it. I, I played with him, at, uh, sang with him at Nebworth in, okay, yeah. I can't remember the year. You might know, 19... 19- no. 1986. Well, no. they've, just re- they've just released it, haven't they, on Blu-ray? Yeah, uh, yeah. Genesis were on the bill, and lots of big names were on the bill. I That's think. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But, and, uh, uh, you sang there as well. Yeah, so I've sung with, and I've sung on a couple of recordings, and I've done a couple, a few. We did a charity thing at the Albert Hall with David, uh, a Colombian charity. I sang on that, so I'd been involved with them before. I'd known him for a long time. But um, interestingly, at that uh, that gig you mentioned, Claire uh, Claire Story came out and she sang "Greg Egan the Sky." If I'm not yeah, mistaken, did you did. get to meet Claire and talk about her experience? Yeah, well, I knew I knew Claire anyway because Claire was um, so my mum was a session singer and my mum sang with Pink Floyd uh, years ago, nice. on and off. Um, and Claire was a session singer and I knew her and I'd met her. She's a very nice lady. Sure. Was there a sense of anticipation on your own part, knowing that you've got to get on stage and you've got to perform that very iconic piece? Did you feel very nervous about it? Well, I think, um, obviously, initially, the first couple of times you do it, yes. Um, I loved the way it was split up. I don't know if Durga had anything to do with that, but that sort of came about. I don't know how that happened, where they split it into three sections. But I think that's a really... I think I went to see the Momentary Lapse of Reason tour and I saw them do that, and I thought that was a fantastic idea because it takes the weight out of it. You know, sure. to sing it as a whole piece is hard, hard really hard. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, but I think actually the way we did it with Durga and and dear Claudia, uh, I think it worked really well. Um, I I wasn't particularly nervous. I mean, you know, singing is it was a great thing to sing. Uh, it was quite hard. I, I hadn't done any voice training at that point. And so now, because I went on to do a lot of voice training afterwards, and I wish I'd had the benefit of that because I think I would have done it a bit better if I'd if I'd had that. Sure. Um, there, there was one gig. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was a massive stadium somewhere. And, of course, you get loads of people right down the front. Yeah. And I'm up there singing singing great gig and singing the first section and I can hear this sort of echo and I look down and there's a woman a girl or a lady in the front row and she's singing it but brilliantly I mean really brilliantly and I'm I'm there singing it and thinking well why isn't she up here <laughs> you can do it so bloody well you get up here <laughs> but uh yeah so no it was great it was it was um, a privilege to do it really yeah, wonderful. I mean, it's a wonderful performance as well on the Pulse uh, Blu-ray, which has been reissued. But were you at the were you at that gig, the the one where the seating collapsed in London? Yeah, at Earl's Court. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what was that? What was that like being backstage when something like that happened? Um, well, David, it's been alarming. Uh, well, it is, but you, of course, there's a delayed reaction. But we didn't really know what had happened. We just knew that something had happened. Mm-hmm. And uh, they stopped the show, and I think David ran down to where he probably could see because he was at the front, so he could probably see what happened. So he ran down, and the show was stopped. I can't remember. Uh, did they re? I think they rescheduled it. I can't. I can't actually remember. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, of course, it is alarming, and you just hope that no one's been hurt. Really, is the is the main thing, you know? Sure. I mean, if I if I may take you back to that air hanger, I mean, uh, where you were thrashing out this music. I mean, famously on the Momentary Lapse of Reason tour, apparently Pink Floyd uh, thrashed out Sheep with the idea of doing that live, but later decided not to. So I'm just wondering whether there's any material that they played in rehearsal that didn't make it into the live set, or can you remember? I don't think there was. I think we because we done well, we did all the music. No, I think it was pretty much decided before we got there before the musicians got there to play i think they'd already worked that out what what they wanted to do and what they didn't right right um i uh, have well actually have one more question for you really and it's one of those it's one of those stinkers actually it's uh uh if you had to name a song that um that you wish you'd written and sung which song would that be <clears throat> that's a very difficult question and there's so many songs. That's the problem. There's so many. Uh, I know. I know. Um, gosh, 
Mine would be the boxer by Simon and Garfunkel. Oh, and would it? Oh, uh, yeah, I can understand that. I can understand beautiful that. Song, beautiful. I think, and this is probably going to be a bit obscure, but there's a song called Sun Shower, which was written by Jimmy Webb and right. sung by Thelma Houston. And right. it's absolutely beautiful. I think I'm going to go for that. Is it something like, is it something about the melody of a song or are you attracted to the, the, the vocal performance? I mean, as a singer, what a, what attracts you to to hear, listening to something particularly? Um, I think it's the atmosphere of it and the lyrics. Right, right. I'm not, I, I love good singers, but I'm not bound by good singers. I love, I love Patti Smith. I mean, another choice actually would be Because the Night. Um, she, she's got a very distinctive voice, hasn't she? She has, has a, yeah. A yeah. sort of sneery voice, which has worked yeah. beautifully with music. I mean, I think, you know, I'm not a big fan of poetry, I have to say, and I haven't really listened to her. her she does poetry now. Does. But I think the, uh, you know, she plainly doesn't give a shit what she sounds like. <laughs> you know, she plainly is just an expression for her. And yeah. I, I think that's what I love in singers, you know, is when it is just pure expression. But the lyrics are important to me as well, the words. Yeah. Are you a big fan of Joni Mitchell? I am a big fan of Joni Mitchell, yeah. Yeah, I love Joni Mitchell. I go through phases. At the moment, I'm listening to Ladies of the Canyon a lot. That's my fa That's actually my favourite album. I get attacked a lot for saying that because everybody should sort of Lord Blue and some <laughs> more experimental jazzy stuff she did later. It's, it's probably uncool to say that Ladies of the Canyon is your favourite album. But uh, oh, is yeah. it? Well, I, well, actually, I think it is probably my favourite album. I, I've Blue, I know very, very well because it was the first Joni album I listened to. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what I listened to after that, but I've listened to all her albums. I'm with you on the jazzy thing. It's not really up my street, but I think Ladies of the Canyon is beautiful. And in fact, another song that I, I wish I'd written or I love is Woodstock. I just think it is an absolutely beautiful piece of songwriting. The well, words it's, are amazing. It's a fascinating song, and she wasn't even yeah. at Woodstock either. She, <laughs> no. she wrote it about... You're watching it on the telly, I think, and wishing she was there. Wow. But what is interesting about the Ladies of the Canyon album is that there's more exper experience with keyboards and that on it. Uh, she mm -hmm. moves away from the trill, sunny folk of the first two albums. And yeah. There's more textures on that one. I think Rolling Stone said she's moved from the uh, festivals to the parlour room or something with this album. So you can almost <laughs> anticipate Blue, really, with the way she was going with the instrumentation. Yeah, yeah. But it's a, it's a, so I see it as a wonderful uh, transitional album for her. But uh, I'll have to email her, see if I can get an interview with her. Yeah, you should. You definitely <laughs> Why not? not? Why, why wouldn't she? <laughs> wow. I, I emailed David Gilmore, actually, to be honest with you. I asked him, uh, I thought I'll chance it, you know, this, it, it, I probably won't get any. But I, bef before I even pressed send on the email, his reply came back, not on your Nelly, mate. Don't even think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what it said? No, well, it was much more polite, much politer than that. It was a, it was a, an email from one of the people that probably is cool. serves cool. a buffer, cool. stop, stop us nuisances yeah. getting to it, really. Just saying. Well, that. I think, I, I think his manager used to be my manager, Paul Lowsby, and um, I think the 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 difficulty is is um, so many, so many requests like that. So, so many requests, and you just yeah. can't do them all. It's as simple as that. You just can't. oh, absolutely. I mean, I just sent it as a as a just to see yeah. what happened, really. But yeah. Uh, yeah. also as a singer, I'm just interested, uh, what do you think of Kate Bush and the way she sings? Well, that I, love, I, love, I love Kate Bush. I mean, uh, you know, I, I understand how her voice grates with some people. I, I never really heard that until someone pointed it out to me. I just <laughs> I just heard the songs and the, and the atmosphere of it and the arrangements, and it's so rich, you know. Yes. <clears throat> especially the first, that first album or the kick inside and then a uh, lion heart in the second album, i think it's the second album um <clears throat> there's so much in it in in her albums i love it and ariel is I, I think she's brilliant i really do i love what she does and i love the fact that she just follows her own vision and yeah. she doesn't seem to be in any way bound by expectations which personally i think if you're going to make music that is the way it has to be you know because you you can't you can't have freedom to to write and and or, or rather you can't not have the freedom to write and and create something really brilliant. I don't think. Well, in my limited knowledge of singers, she seems to be operating constantly in what they would call like a head voice, really to get yeah. that 
Yeah. I'm just wondering if that's particularly healthy, really, whether that's a good technique <laughs> or not. I don't know. but uh... Well, I don't know, but we're all made differently and people's voices, everyone's voice sounds different, don't they? I mean, you know, Jules has got a very kind of nasally voice, which is at the back of his throat. And, mm. um, you know, someone like uh, uh, Dusty Springfield has got a lot of breath in her voice, but mm. still got the power. You know, people just sound different. I think all our voices are so different. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 one presiding memory of whenever I put Kate Bush on when I was, when I was years ago, my mother would say, "Bloody hell, you just let the cat in." <laughs> she, was, she was never a fan of that, that sort of screeching. No. But, it, but no, it wasn't no. just about that; it was about the sort of the this tapestry that she was weaving, this atmosphere. It was just absolutely yeah. fantastic. Yeah, def uh, definitely. Yeah, uh, I love Kate Bush. I think she's great. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to thank you for doing this interview. I'd like to thank you for, despite your. Um, the, the difficulties actually putting out this album i hope it sells well for you i really do and uh, uh and maybe one day you'll you'll find your voice you'll, you'll find it you know under the bed or something like that when you left <laughs> i it. hope so i haven't looked under the bed actually i'll go and do that now <laughs> well hopefully i'm hoping it is some sort of psychological block and you overcome it and you start singing and you want to sing live again because it'd be wonderful to see you on stage and doing all these um these quality tunage you have in your back catalogue <laughs> yeah, well, I'd, love, I'd love that too. <laughs> Fingers crossed, eh? Yeah, indeed. Anyway, thank you so much. Um, I wish you the best of luck, best of luck with this album, and um, hopefully with singing and things like that. And uh, um, I'll say it again Happy New Year to you. Oh, thank you. I have to ask you, Barry, before you go, did you do that painting behind you? My wife's the, the artist. She does. She's got loads of paintings uh, around us, uh, but she's a very talented artist, actually. She is, isn't she? It looks absolutely beautiful. Lovely colours. It it it's yours for a grand if you want it. Oh, OK. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't have a spare grand. But uh, well, when if, you I... want to see, if you want to see some fantastic art, look at this. Ah, perfect. My six-year-old daughter did that. It looks like an REM album cover, doesn't it? <laughs> My six-year-old daughter did it. We love it, so we've got it up here as a constant reminder of how unique she is. You should have it framed. We will do, we will do. <laughs> All right, Melissa, thank you so much. It's been lovely thank to you. talk to you. Thank you so much. All the best. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.